So uh, we would like to start with the Ask the Do Doctor session. Uh, we have uh, 60 minutes uh, for this, and uh, Dr. Kyle will uh, uh, moderate it. Um, uh, uh, we want to stick to the 60 minutes, so please um, try, we, we will try to have the question as general as possible so most pen patients can benefit from, from it and to avoid the more personal uh, questions because uh, we want to stick to the 60 minutes uh, for every ta everybody's uh, time uh, schedule. Yeah, and I think also tell them that uh, we'll do these questions that are written and then at the end uh, we'll yeah. do so because we need to know what is coming. Yeah. Okay, so we will stick to the to the English uh, to the written questions uh, at start. Um, if there are some translation questions, we are not uh, very multilingual. Uh, it's Dutch or English. I'm sorry, we know French or German. Oh, and well, of course, yeah, one, one Spanish-speaking colleague. Um, so we we try to do our best. But uh, Dr. Kyle. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, again. Uh, uh, you folks have a asked some very, very good questions, uh, questions that I think will, uh, uh, will challenge our uh, panel here. And uh, if they know the answers to all of these, uh, I'll, I'll learn too. <coughs> okay. And our first question here is why does rituxan uh, work for some people and not for others? Let's just uh, hear what the panelists say right down the line here. And you could be exempt from this, Zach. Maybe you'll have an answer. Uh, he's probably most likely to know. He's most qualified. He's most qualified. Okay. Um, I think, to be honest, we, we don't know why it's working for some patients and for others it don't. I must say it's, it, it's the truth for a lot of therapies we, we do. We don't have good prognostic markers uh, for most therapies to know which will work and which won't. So we know it will work for around 30 to 40 percent of patients, but if you will be in the group or not, it's a bit, a bit of a, your own trial, personal trial. So maybe I can add there are some, uh, I mean the question is what do you call reductive sensitivity or insensitivity? It depends on whether or not you, no, whether or not you combine it with uh, chemotherapy is a, is a big difference. But there is some genetic underlying uh, polymorphisms that some uh, patients have that make you uh, make it less likely for you to respond to rituximab and it has to do something with the recruitment of the effector cells that actually kill the tumor cells when uh, rituximab binds the CD20 antigen. So, so there is some underlying uh, genetic uh, It's something mechanism. you commonly do? You test we it? don't test it now because, we, yeah, because it, it's not like a black and white thing so it's not that if you have the polymorphism you don't respond you just have a, a lower chance of responding. <coughs> Dr. Castillo, can you help, can you help us in this uh, regard? No. <laughs> <coughs> That's a very honest answer. So, I mean, I, I, have, to, I have to basically <laughs> echo what, what MJ, uh, Dr. Kirsten here said. I mean, uh, there are some polymorphisms and specific receptors that will make rituximab less effective. Now, that is when we use rituximab as a single agent. When we combine it with either Velcade, carfilzomib, bendamastin, or cyclophosphamide, you know, we really do not know if that that actually holds true. So, in our practice, uh, we do not essentially we do not do that testing. Now, some people do not respond at all to rituximab, and some people are fantastic responders to rituximab. I mean, obviously, what mediates that I think is is uh, is very unclear at the time. Dr. Hunter, can you uh, shed any light on this? You're getting down to the genome. You're looking at at uh, all of these genes and so forth. Uh, we really need some help here. So, you know, Dr. Kyle, I'm embarrassed to say we actually haven't looked at that particular question. Um, and we just, you know, a lot of this is very new and we haven't had a chance. Um, I. The only thing I can do is, is echo what everyone else has said uh, about the FC uh, gamma receptor. And, you know, and the theory is just simply that there are some people who have 
for whom antibodies in general actually just dock a little bit better than others. And, um, and as Dr. Castillo said, that's, that is, uh, you know, you're, you're, we're really pushing things along the edges. So once you combine it, it's less clear how important that is. So it's a great question, and um, hopefully, hopefully in a couple of years we'll have the answer. <laughs> Okay, Dr. Volks. <laughs> Great to be at the end of the line, I guess. No, I really have absolutely nothing to add to all these uh, considerations. <coughs> okay, well, uh, I think it's a unanswerable question uh, today. Uh, I have seen patients who have had a a course of rituximab uh, one, once per week for four weeks and have a response, a virtually complete response that will go for 10 years. Uh, and of course, there are many others who don't have any response at all. In fact, uh, roughly speaking, about half the patients, uh, in my experience, will get a response from the rituximab, and it will, uh, and the duration of that response is again quite variable from years to uh, to a matter of of weeks. So that is something that your doctor. I don't think is going to be able to help you very much with as to whether you will get real benefit or not. Uh, here is a question. Uh, that uh, uh, that uh, asks, uh, should a, uh, yeah, well, actually, I think we'll pass on that a moment. It was a question on survival about a slide from Dr. Garcia Sands, and since he has returned to Salamanca, we'll <laughs> set that aside because I think he, he's the only one that might have, a, have an answer on that. I have been diagnosed as WM, but uh, uh, do not know if it is asymptomatic or symptomatic. I heard that, uh, 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 that uh, there is a difference in treatment between the two situations. And uh, finally, that my doctor has not uh, 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 told me, I've not heard anything about this from my doctor. Well, it's important to know, of course, because when you're asymptomatic, no treatment is given, and when you're symptomatic, uh, a tailored personal, uh, on your personal situation and, and comorbidities treatments can be given. But normally, you would know if you were symptomatic. Um, so uh, normally, a doctor should not have to tell you. Um, but it's, if you're not treated at the moment, you're probably asymptomatic, and if treatment started, you were probably symptomatic. Uh, but there, we gave a list of symptoms uh, that, that are associated with Waldström's disease. They are not all caused by Waldström's, but if a relation can be made, uh, improvement can be seen with treatment. So that's a general concept, I think, for asymptomatic. Can Any I other panelists add something? Yes, no, I totally agree with Monique. Uh, is it also possible to ask the patients a question or no? So how many of you uh, know your IgM level? I thought that would be an... Uh... Okay. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> good. No, because... <laughs> no, but uh, as Monique said, uh, you're, the, you're the expert on your uh, disease, so you know whether you're, not, you're symptomatic or not. But I do think also it's important for doctors to educate uh, the patients. Patients uh, should, uh, can have more control if they know about their situation, and um, I think that's an important issue. Yes, I think that is a very good point, and I, I was impressed with the number of hands that were raised here. It used to be that the doctor knew everything and uh, the patient didn't know anything about their disease or their numbers or anything <laughs> like that. 
but it's exactly as Dr. Kasten says, patients know themselves and the more information they have, uh, the better that they, and then talk to the doctor and ask, and the more information that both sides have, I think the better the outcome. Yeah, I mean, uh, I know that some, some physicians might get intimidated by uh, patients asking too many questions or pa patients reading too much about their own disease. But the way I see it, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not concerned about that. I mean, I really think that, you know, we can have a meaningful conversation. Uh, I can have a meaningful conversation with my patients when the patient is actually more educated about their disease and we can make uh, better decisions together. You know, I can tell you what treatments we have and what are the pros and cons, but I'll, I will learn from you, you know, what your preferences are, what your expectations are, and that complements the decision making that we, that we go through. We won't uh, trouble you with this one, Zach. Uh, that, well, I completely agree with Jorge, and I also think uh, that I hope this person will ask the same question to their own doctor the next time, because I think it's definitely something that you, the, the person who's taking care of you should be able to, uh, to explain. And I hope, uh, I hope with your next appointment you will ask the question again. Very good. And here is another question. I am allergic to chlorambucil. Uh, 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 is there any research uh, concerning allergic reactions to the chlorambucil? We don't know this, the uh, symptoms of the reaction here, but in my experience, this would be a very, very rare phenomenon. Uh, what about the rest of the panelists here? Allergy to chlorambucil, leucoran, we call it. I haven't seen it. Yes, yeah, so I've seen a couple of patients who have fever or, uh, or rash, and it's, but it's very rare. It's a very old drug. I mean, it's been yeah. around uh, since... This is Probably. one of the very earliest yes. uh, alkylating agents been around for 44, almost 60 years. Right, yeah, yeah, but it's, so it's usually extremely well tolerated. Yeah, you just shouldn't take it for years and years because then it can have side effects. Yeah. Yes, uh, and the side effects consist mainly, of course, of lowering of the blood counts, but more important than that, it can cause a pre-leukemic or even a leukemic uh, uh, stage, so uh, it's a drug that uh, we don't use very much of it anymore. Uh, is much of it used in the Netherlands? Uh, not that much, but it in, yeah. uh, especially in older patients who don't tolerate other drugs, it, it can still be uh, useful. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, here is a question. Uh, are food supplements of any uh, benefit? Should any be avoided? And uh, uh, Tony, are you here among us? Maybe you could uh, just say a couple of words on that at least. Uh, I think, is there a microphone around? If not, come up and uh, to the podium here a moment. Uh, yeah. Hi, again. Um, so I'm, I'm not exactly sure what's, is this working? Yeah. I'm not exactly sure what's meant by food supplements. Um, uh, but certainly a, a multivitamin is reasonable if you're not getting uh, vitamins that you need uh, through your food and eating uh, a diet that's rich in vegetables and healthy uh, fruits and vegetables. Anyway, multivitamin. Um, we talked about calcium and vitamin D as being acceptable um, 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 additives to your, your diet, um, but we really do ask you to avoid other things, especially in the context of your getting therapy uh, that are over the counter. Um, as supplements, uh, they have um, things in them that we don't know how they interact with um, cancer treatment, and uh, I would just recommend that you ask your oncologist, but really very little in the way of nutritional supplements that I'd recommend. Yeah, and I think that asking your oncologist is probably not the final answer either, 
because your oncologist doesn't know what's in these products by and large. And in the US, these are not uh, controlled by the FDA. So there is no real regulation concerning them. And there can be uh, uh, bad uh, uh, products in there that could be harmful to you. In fact, when patients ask me about supplements in general, I tell them that, uh, uh, and, and especially when the patient uh, uh, is kind of non-specific <coughs> and asks if he, he or she should go down to the local health store and ask the proprietor if they should have a supplement. And I tell them that, well, uh, the only person who is likely to, to uh, benefit benefit from this is the proprietor who is selling the, uh, the supplement. And I'm not going, no comment. Yeah. No, I, 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 I do agree. It's even a greater problem in Europe. I do agree. The so so the, the, the typical uh, position that we take uh, at the Bing Center is if you are not undergoing any treatment whatsoever, feel free to try whatever you feel is going to make you feel better. Uh, if you are getting treatments, avoid anything because the likelihood that you can interact with treatment, and we know this, I mean, you brought up in fish oils, there's interaction. Fish oils is one of the healthiest things that people think could, they could be taking and it, it causes interactions. Uh, green tea extract decreases um, the, the efficacy of ibrutinib. It interacts with bortezomib. So these are the things that we know about because people were taking them and then something happened to these people. So uh, my recommendation is if you're undergoing active treatment, avoid any of these supplements as they more likely, are more likely to actually counteract the beneficial effects of the chemotherapy. Yeah. Or they can increase uh, serum levels and then or increase the toxicity. toxicity. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. right. And I think the, the, the I was going to make <coughs> uh, one comment uh, when I saw your slide on supplements uh, about vitamin D. And uh, I was just going to make the comment that uh, uh, people who live in the northern part uh, of the world, uh, uh, Boston, uh, Minnesota, and uh, uh, northern Europe, uh, actually there are a number of patients who do have uh, vitamin D levels that are below the normal level. So vitamin D deficiency is not, uh, is not an uncommon phenomenon. On the other side of the coin, one should not uh, uh, take large doses of vitamin D either because they are potentially toxic. In fact, our, uh, 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 our uh, people at our institution do not recommend more than 1,000 uh, units uh, daily. So don't think that uh, if one is good, uh, 10 are better. Uh, There's actually, uh, I can add, some evidence that vitamin D levels uh, have something to do with rituximab levels yep. and effectivity of uh, rituximab in a German study. So it yep. might be good to have it checked, but as you said, don't aim for over uh, high levels. Yeah. Uh, here is a kind of an unusual question. I've never come across this before in a uh, patient panel. What is von Willebrand's disease? Uh, for Willebrand's disease, it's a, it's a clotting disease, and it can be uh, hereditary. 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 <laughs> uh, but it can also be acquired, uh, like if you have very high uh, platelets, blood platelets, but also uh, due to high levels of IgM. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a protein of your clotting system that has to interact with other proteins of your clotting system, and there can be influence uh, uh, because of your IgM, and then you can have an acquired von Willebrand's disease. And normally it's, you can have bleedings in the uh, uh, primary hemostatic system, so it's bruising and uh, bleeding right after surgery or nosebleeds, but there are not joints bleeds or uh, very severe bleeds, unless you're operated, of course. 
So uh, we basically check uh, nowadays uh, most of our patients for vulnerable disease at, at the Dana Farber. And uh, we, uh, as, as expected, uh, is seen in mainly in patients with high IgMs. If patients have low IgMs, that typically is not a finding. So in patients with high IgMs over 3,000, it's about 3 4%, so it's not very that high. Yeah. It's very, and, and typically when you treat the patients, the IgM drops, then the bombilaran gets better. Because if we, somebody, we see somebody with this deficiency, we don't know if, it's, if they were born like that, it's just they, they were never diagnosed, or they, had it, they have it because of the high IgM. So in the large majority of cases, we treat, the IgM goes down, the von Willebrand gets better. There have been one or two cases in which we treated, the IgM has gone down, and the von Willebrand did not get better. So those patients probably were born with the, with the deficiency. They were just never diagnosed. But as for any uh, patient, <coughs> it's always important to do a good uh, history. Yes. And you, I, I'm sure you will agree with me. Yeah, so absolutely. always ask for bleeding and uh, other uh, medical. Yes, yeah. and von Willebrand's in our uh, uh, practice is a condition that can be very easily overlooked and uh, and actually missed. So it is something that if you have excessive bleeding from your nose or uh, uh, other sites, and particularly if there are other members of your family who might have the same, be sure and talk to your uh, doctor about this. Uh, we've had, there are several questions here today on, on peripheral neuropathy. And uh, I think uh, uh, that it would be uh, best to uh, say a few words. Uh, there are some uh, who ask about peripheral neuropathy and having just an IgM and others with a peripheral neuropathy having a, uh, uh, all of the findings or virtually all of the findings and symptoms of Waldenstrom's. Uh, would you like to start this? Uh, yes. Um, so when you have Waldenstrom's disease and you have complaints of neuropathy, then it's usually uh, a symptom to start treatment. And most of the treatments is a combined chemo immune therapy regimen. So it's rituximab with some kind of chemotherapy. And when you choose the chemotherapy, don't choose a, a, a drug that causes or can increase the complaint of, of neuropathy. When you have AMGUS, so no Waldstrom, but AMGUS and only neuropathy, it's not always necessary to treat, but it's because it can be a very slowly increasing disease in 10, 15 years, and you, you don't need any treatment for that besides, for example, painkillers or things like that. There are some reports that monotherapy with rituxan, uh, Mabdera, rituximab, <coughs> can work in these patients. Um, but we are, I think we're missing uh, some clinical trials in this area. But the common advice is when the symptoms are not, do not exist for a long time, uh, not more than five, <coughs> six years, they are severely, they are increasing with a steady rate, so not very slowly, but increasing more fast, that, that, that these are the patients that should be considered for a monotherapy with uh, an anti-CD20 antibody. And so it may be uh, Let's important to Let's concentrate a yeah. little bit on the patient who has an IgM monoclonal uh, protein, but does not have uh, anemia or constitutional symptoms of Waldenstrom's that would merit therapy. The patient who comes in with numbness and tingling of their hands and feet, and uh, you uh, uh, work them up, uh, you examine them and so forth, and find that they have a, a small monoclonal IgM protein and a normal uh, blood count, no anemia or any other features of disease. Yes, so I think it's, it's a complicated issue because uh, as Monique said, um, uh, usually we only treat the patients who have progressive disease, but you should also not wait until the disease has progressed for too long because then it doesn't help anymore. Uh, and, uh, and it's not always the case that treatment will actually uh, reduce the neuropathy. It's a more a question of halting uh, the progression. And, there's a, and to complicate it further, the rituximab in some cases might actually worsen the symptoms. 
So it's it's a it's actually well, as Monique said something that really more work uh, should be uh, done to specifically address this. And we hope the new uh, uh, drugs like uh, BTK inhibitors, inhibitors might be a safe uh, option um, to help to treat these patients as well. Dr. Voice has an answer for well, us. Well, an answer, uh, an extra comment, I guess. Um, like, can, um, can you speak into the mic? Uh, yes, sir. Well, like Monique said uh, a little bit already, we have a new um, guideline on neuropathy associated with uh, IgM uh, finished. And the, before the treatment, the big question I always also find very complicated is to see whether the, what the exact cause of the neuropathy is, because for every different like, like I showed with the kidney disease, there is also a whole spectrum of neuropathies and the first step is to make sure that the neuropathy is actually caused by the IgM because there's lots of other conditions and then connected to the IgM there is also a whole type of neuropathies that all deserve their own approach. So um, my the comment was that I think people, especially when they have a lot of complaints, they should really be seen by a by a dedicated neurologist that has a lot of experience um, with this group of patients to dis distinguish the, the right diagnosis before uh, t considering th uh, which type of therapy. But yeah. uh, Dr. Castillo, uh, what do you think? Uh, uh, the patient has an IgM monoclonal protein. Is this the cause of the sensory motor peripheral neuropathy? Yeah, I think um, uh, if, if you start pulling people out of the streets, just random people out of the streets and you ask them, do you have neuropathy or you have Waldenstrom separately? The likelihood that anybody out of the streets randomly has neuropathy is much, much, much higher than actually having Waldenstrom. Not, not in this room, <laughs> outside. So the, I, think, I think Josephine's point is, ex is excessively well taken. I mean, the first step is to really establish the relation between the IgM monoclonal gamopathy and the neuropathy. Because if you do have diabetic neuropathy, you don't want to get rituximab for that. And you, you don't want to get chemo for that, right? So we need to make sure that we, that we roll out most of the most common things, uh, vitamin B12 deficiency, thyroid problems, autoimmune diseases, and things like that. Other conditions like amyloidosis and, and, and things of, the, of that nature. Uh, compressions, I mean, radiculopathy, what we call, uh, you know, arthritis is causing compressions of the nerves in the back. It's a very common reason for, for neuropathy in, in, you know, in patients in general. So there are multiple reasons to have neuropathy, and we need to make sure that neuropathy is not, it is because of the Waldenstrom's at least. I don't think we will never be completely sure, right, in a way there's not 100% certainty. But we can eliminate other processes that are very common, and then we end up with a very high suspicion rate that this could be associated with, with yeah, IgM secretion. I think secretion. that's a very important point, is to uh, look for other causes of peripheral neuropathy and don't overlook uh, diabetes and some of the more common causes. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that, uh, just as has been pointed out, that uh, sensory motor peripheral neuropathy is common in uh, patients. In fact, uh, there was a study uh, some years ago of a group of patients age 75 or greater who had absolutely no symptoms of peripheral neuropathy. And, uh, 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 a neurologist actually specializing in peripheral neuropathy could find no abnormalities, no reflex changes, no sensory changes on examination. And uh, then an EMG was done, and that's a test, as many of you know, in which needles are put into the muscle, and uh, uh, you can tell whether there is any damage to the nerves or not and uh, about 20% of the persons above the age of 75 had evidence of neuropathy on the EMG, yet had no symptoms, and the uh, uh, neurologist was unable to find any abnormalities. And if you take that one step further, 
Uh, we have all seen, as physicians, patients who have had uh, uh, drugs such as bortezomib, uh, Velcade, and some patients after just a few injections of Velcade will have or will develop a peripheral neuropathy uh, and I suspect that those patients are ones who are older and already have nerve damage from whatever cause, uh, age, whatever, uh, and uh, that the Velcade then pushes them over into a, uh, into a symptomatic state and they develop uh, the peripheral neuropathy uh, very soon. And then there are others who seem to take the uh, drug for a long period of time and don't get any uh, uh, symptoms or findings. Yes, there are actually also some genetic, again, some genetic polymorphisms, factors that uh, increase the likelihood of having neuropathy upon treatment with uh, uh, bortezomib and vinca alkaloids. Uh. Yeah. Yes, and also keep in mind that uh, that person age 70 uh, who has a, a peripheral neuropathy has a 5% chance of having an MGUS. Uh, and of those 5%, uh, uh, there will be one of those 20% uh, 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 of them who will have an IgM monoclonal protein and whether the neuropathy is actually related to the IgM or not, I think is a uh, valid question. So this whole area is very, very gray. Uh, what about treatment of that patient who has now an MGUS and has a sensory motor peripheral neuropathy and you as the doctor uh, can't find any other cause, there's no diabetes or anything like that. What, uh, what do you do for those people? And it's an, an MGUS, not it's a, a well, it's, term. well yeah. it's an MGUS, yes. Let's say that it is an MGUS, IgM type. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so it would depend uh, on whether or not there are progressive symptoms. So if there's no progression... Okay, they, would... I've had this for <laughs> uh, three, six, eight months, and mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's really miserable. I have trouble sleeping at night. It wakes me up, uh, mm -hmm. and it's, it's really, uh, really bothers me. What can you do for me, doctor? Yeah, so we would like to have a clinical trial. <laughs> we don't at the moment. Yeah. And we should have a clinical trial. That's something uh, also during the workshop that we discussed, that we should develop a clinical trial. <coughs> but yeah. yes, so as Jorge said, you discuss with the patient several options. You can either try single agent rituximab or uh, immunochemotherapy. Well, I think first of all, what uh, do you use uh, amitriptyline, uh, you know, gabapentin, for, yeah. lyrica, mm -hmm. uh, things like that for the symptom, treatment? Yes. Sim you mean symptom relief? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Which is what we want. Mm -hmm. I yeah. mean, uh, or I mean, this is what the patient wants. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we use several, you, you discussed it, so several. Um, um, and why do we have several? drugs like that, agents, because none of them works very well. <laughs> are, yeah, none of them is very effective. And in my experience, one patient will get, gee, they'll get pretty good benefit from amitriptyline. Mm -hmm. The next patient won't have any effect and so on down the line. And uh, basically speaking, uh, none of these agents are really effective, but they can be helpful from one patient to the next. And in my experience, you just have to experiment a bit and uh, give it to the patient. And uh, uh, if the patient is better, fine. If the patient isn't, then one has to move on to something else. But it is a very, very challenging uh, uh, question. And uh, you also see the peripheral neuropathy in patients with not only IgM, but also in patients with IgA or IgG.
G, and those are the patients in which it's very difficult to know whether there is any relationship between the neuropathy and the monoclonal protein. Uh, yes, uh, may I make an additional remark? Because it's already said, also diabetes can give uh, neuropathy, and I noticed that the um, advice that um, Tony gave was about some supplements, alpha de Ponsure and the other one I always forget, but she had two uh, names. These are drugs known uh, from the diabetes trial, so these are drugs uh, that can be effective for patients with diabetes-related neuro uh, neuropathy. But for uh, the IgM-related neuropathy, it's not demonstrated. There has been a trial with antioxidants in patients with chemotherapy-induced neuropathy, so in, in solid cancer, but it was a finca alkaloid like fincristine, and the antioxidants made the, uh, the complaints worse. So for me, in, in, in my practice, I do not advise for these supplements because there's no data that support that in the IgM uh, setting, but I know in the United States it's, it's the common practice to do so. So that's also something in this area, you find recommendations that can be different between some countries. Well, when, we, when we see a patient or like that, um, you know, we say that there's no secret, you know, magic potion that they can take for the neuropathy to get better. So some people really would not like to take any prescriptions, right? Because, I mean, pregabalin and, and gabapentin, all these medications can make you more somnolent, tired, or fatigue, gain weight. I mean, there are so many problems with those. So in, in the cases in which patients really do, do not want to be on any prescription, then we give them these options. But again, uh, I, don't, I don't give them the options in a list of preference. I mean, this is what other patients are doing, and it's working in some, it's, 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 working, it's not working in others, and, you know, and they are more than welcome to try whatever they feel like. Now, um, I think the severity of the neuropathy really dictates what yes. we're supposed to do with those patients much more than anything else. A mild neuropathy can go on for decades without affecting the patient's lives in any way, and treatment might not be necessary ever. In patients who have this rapid developing or, or moderate severe neuropathy in which their quality of life, activities of the daily living are being affected, those are the patients that I, I, I tend to believe they benefit more from treatments. Yeah, one other question, or one other point that I would add is, is that if, if uh, you have a, 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 quote, asymptomatic or smoldering Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia and your uh, major or even only symptom is sensory motor peripheral neuropathy, I'm uh, reluctant to treat that patient for Waldenstrom's per se. Uh, and expect to get a response from the peripheral, uh, of the peripheral neuropathy. Uh, generally speaking, we don't see much improvement in, uh, in peripheral neuropathy with, uh, with treatment for Waldenstrom's, and generally most patients uh, will, uh, uh, will report or you will find that maybe their peripheral neuropathy is stabilized but uh, it's uh, uncommon for that neuropathy to disappear. Panelists, any? No, I agree, yeah. Huh. Yeah, I would agree with that. Okay. Dr. Castillo, there are a couple of questions here, and this one uh, is when are you going to release the uh, data, the information on exazomib study? Is that you, Pete? You wrote that question, right? Where are you? No? The usual suspects. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we released uh, uh, data on the first uh, 20 patients that completed the first six months of induction during this meeting. Uh, I think by ASH, uh, which is the American Society of Hematology meeting in December, we might be able to release the data from the 26 patients who completed the first six months of treatment. Uh, I don't think uh, those are actionable items based on, you know, regulatory speaking. Uh, we need to com wait until everybody completes the whole year of maintenance and, and then go from there. So probably a year from now. Yes, and uh, uh, we've had many drugs over the years that uh, appear to be helpful but it seems that uh, the more one uses the drug, the less effective it is. Uh, 
Peripheral neuropathy is a very, very tough problem, not only for the patient, but for the doctor to manage as well. Okay, here is a question. I'm feeling cold. Uh, are these, uh, is this uh, a part of the uh, symptoms for Waldenstrom's? Um, because of the, the cryoglobulins? Um, no, 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 that's why she directs the question to me. No, 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 I think, um, well, you know, there was another question here because we also still have some Dutch questions um, about uh, not having night sweats but uh, uh, having sweats during the day. There, there are all these sort of atypical symptoms and um, what I typically say which sounds like an easy way out but it's the truth um, it's very hard sometimes to say if these can be attributed to a disease or not and definitely when someone's feeling cold I would check for anemia because that would be my first association but it's also the thing you've probably already checked it um, so I would try to find out what the feeling cold exactly implies because it can mean different things but people with cryoglobulins or cold agglutinins don't complain about feeling cold they get you know hemolysis and then anemia or they get the skin uh, marks that I showed so in my um, briefest experience of the whole panel this is not a typical Waldstrom symptom but it might be in, in cases yeah anyone have anything to add to that yeah, I mean, cold sensitivity is, is, is common, and I think uh, it's common with aging. It's common in places in, in, you know, where we live in which, you know, the, the temperatures can be, you know, really ungodly. So, um, you know, I, I, I try to be very careful. I try to, you know, if the patient is complaining of, of, of feeling cold at the point that it is affecting their quality of life, then I, I tend to, to check for cryos and cold agglutinins and, and make sure that I understand really what's going on in there. If it, 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 yeah. Exactly. So yeah. other reasons, yeah. anemia, iron deficiency, thyroid functions, other, there are other, you know, endocr endocrine and other medical problems that could be associated with feeling cold. And, you know, recently I had a patient who was having these cold spells, uh, you know, twice a, twice a day, lasting for an hour. It would basically just uh, um, destroy him. He was, he was like completely, you know, unable to do anything. Um, and uh, he also had a diagnosis of uh, uh, Parkinson's. So we were back and forth between this is Waldenstrom, this is the Parkinson's. The Parkinson doctor said, no, it's not the Parkinson's, it might be the Waldenstrom's. So the Waldenstrom's doctor said, it's not Waldenstrom, it might be the Parkinson's. So we were like back and forth. Poor guy was like one of these ping pong balls back and forth. And then uh, we decided to buy the bullet. I mean, he was a little bit anemic. Um, he was just 10.2 in terms of the units in the United States. And we said, you know what? Let's treat you and see if this is truly the case. So we treated this patient. Anemia got better. IgM improved. The cold spells did not go away. Did, did, not, go did not go away. So the neurologist was like, oh, maybe it's the, maybe it's the Parkinson's. <laughs> so they treated the Parkinson's, and the cold spells did not go away either. And 10.2 is like 6.2 millimoles per liter for a Dutch uh, yeah. So patients. unfortunately, we were not able to help no. the patient. Um, and so did a one patient clinical trial. That's right. Yes. <laughs> I failed. Yes. Uh, this is a question. Uh, what, is the pro what are the problems of taking rituxan for a long term? And uh, maybe we could rephrase that and say, is it uh, a good idea to take rituxan for a long period of time? In other words, uh, as a maintenance uh, type of therapy. And I think that uh, the panelists may have some different opinions on this. Shall we? I think the, if there's a problem with uh, a long use of rituxan, it's mostly on infection rate. So people can have low IgG levels and more infections in general. So that's the, the main problem with long-term use. Um, the use can, uh, prolonged use can um, make your disease stay away perhaps a little bit longer, but we think it was not investigated in the right way. And what we, we've written a Dutch guideline, in, in that, that guideline we have said that it's not appropriate to use it as a first-line treatment, but if a patient relapses very soon, so within two years after his first treatment, 
it's some, something that can be considered to use uh, in the second line treatment. So treat for a fixed period and then have a two year maintenance with, uh, with reduction to prolong your PFS and not to be in your third line of treatment uh, uh, very soon. Um, but there are no prospective trials done with a, a good randomization that shows benefit for the patients uh, and therefore it's not commonly used in the Netherlands. Yes, and the same in the U.S. Uh, it, <coughs> it is, uh, well, uh, I shouldn't say that, in our part of the U.S. Uh, it's also a very expensive drug uh, taken over a long period of time as well. And uh, that's something that uh, uh, is not really taken care of, even if a patient has good insurance, so to speak. And sometimes you'll find the patient who says, oh, it doesn't cost me anything. My insurance covers it. Well, in the big picture, that person's insurance uh, uh, costs are going to <clears throat> increase if a lot of people are on any expensive uh, drug and the like. So, uh, in general, we would uh, give the rituximab just for a limited period of time, usually just the four weeks, and if there is no response whatsoever, then we would go on to something else, because today we do have more options. Yes, and I do think uh, there's to, to, just like you said, uh, patients do have uh, uh, already, without the rituximab maintenance, sometimes do not recover their normal immunoglobulin levels and have lots of uh, mostly uh, upper respiratory yeah. tract infections. And the other thing is, it's something that you see in Weldenstrom's patients, but hardly in any other patients, is that some pa the patients really get sensitized to the rituximab uh, infusions. And they get, because uh, usually in patients with lymphoma, for example, you only see the infusion-related re uh, reactions the first, during the first administration, but there are uh, actually yeah, lo uh, lots of Waldenstrom patients in whom it gets more and more difficult to infuse the rituximab. But it's, well, I'm, I'm not sure why you see it in Waldenstrom patients, yeah. but it's uh, quite common, I think. That's right. About 8%. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so um, we are uh, somewhat proponents of the maintenance uh, rituximab in Waldenstrom's, and uh, it's a, I mean, I showed you earlier, it's a retrospective study, um, was not randomized, um, and, and we see, you know, potential benefits on, on doing something like that, specifically to delay the progression to the next treatment. Uh, there is no difference in overall survival. Actually, in that study there was, but I think it's extremely biased, so I'm not even going to mention that, that graph. I'm, I'm the main crit, crit, you know, criticism, critic, critic of my own, of our own research. So, um, but I think there's something on progression-free survival, and the reason I'm saying that is because there's data on other lymphomas similar to Waldenstrom's in which maintenance rituximab uh, is used commonly uh, in the frontline setting, follicular lymphoma, based on the PRIMA study, as, as many other lymphomas too. So transprolating from that experience, you know, I do believe progression-free survival will be extended or could be extended with maintenance rituximab. Now, the, the Germans are doing a randomized study in which they have exposed patients to bendamustine rituximab and then randomized them to maintenance and no-maintenance, and I, I hope those results will be updated shortly. Now, um, when I recommend maintenance rituximab is to the patient in whom uh, has not gotten a, 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 a response as, as much as I would like it to, symptomatically speaking or by numbers, and it's not automatically two years. You know, uh, uh, we don't, I don't like to use it uh, the four weekly every six months, like they, they do in CLL. I don't like to use the every two months, the one that they use in the PRIMA study. The one that we use is the Vaners, which is once every three months, What's the, which is the least rituximab is eight infusions over two years. And, and we tell the patients, you know, you could get it up to two years. Doesn't mean you will get it for two years. We evaluate it, and we evaluate IgG levels, we evaluate IgA levels, we evaluate re infection rates, and, and things of that nature. Uh, and sometimes we cut it short. Sometimes at the six-month mark is enough. At the, at the year, some people get at the two years. Typically, we do not go over two years. And, there is, uh, and the reason for that is there is a study, not in Waldenstrom's, in another lymphoma. We need to learn from other lymphomas, too, because they accrue quicker than, than our studies. So there was a, a Swiss study in which, in patients with follicular lymphoma, they exposed them to two years of maintenance versus five years of maintenance. And the five-year maintenance group that was randomized did not do any better in terms of better responses, deeper responses, longer responses, and had a much higher toxicity. 
So in my mind, uh, there is a group of people who will benefit from maintenance. Not everybody will. Um, we need to be very careful of the potential side effects that are specific for water storms. Um, and, and we don't go beyond two years just because the, you know, that, that other study really showed that it's not, it's not appropriate. So in short, there are probably more opinions on the duration of rituxan than uh, there is uh, solid evidence. So uh, you kind of talk it over with your doctor and decide, and many of us would give it just for the four weeks, and, uh, and, and then, of course, if a patient has a good response and relapses a long time later, then we would go back to the rituximab again. And in my experience, that may or it may not work uh, when one comes back. Uh, we have, I think, a very important question here. Uh, what percentage of bone marrow infiltration uh, uh, should the physician begin treatment for Waldenstrom's? Dr. Bennett. Well, that's, that's an interesting thing, and I think it's, it's almost the same like with your IgM level. And that's what we're trying to say. It's not the level or the percentage that dictates <clears throat> if you should start treatments, because it's not a symptom. Of course, with your IgM, you can be too high, like Dr. Castillo said, and be in a high risk for hyperviscosity, which is a serious uh, problem, and if we can prevent that, we should be careful with that. But there's no percentage that dictates treatment. That said, how, when there's a high infiltration, like 80%, then, of course, uh, the most likelihood you will have anemia, uh, blutarmuda, you will have low platelet counts or low uh, neutrophil counts. So, uh, but because there's only 20% room left, speaking for your normal bone marrow function. But in the end, the blood count, uh, uh, cell counts count, and not the percentage of bone marrow infiltration. Totally agree. Can, can I, um, um, here, Dr. Kyle. Can I uh, ask a Dutch question that is related uh, that I have on the card here? All right. Oh. Oh. Um, so there is a Dutch question here that I, because I wanted to ask Zach actually, and it is related to this one. So the question is, um, when you have high infiltration in the bone marrow, it doesn't automatically mean a high AGM and the other way around. Um, very good question. How does this, how does this work? And um, I'd love to know. So. Maybe you can. <laughs> <laughs> so would I. <laughs> um, so like with most things on the research front, we don't really know is the honest answer. Now, um, there has been some great work actually done by uh, one of uh, Dr. Kyle's <laughs> colleagues over at the Mayo, Steve Ansel, looking at uh, some of this question um, in terms of specific factors that can <laughs> modulate IgM. And we've done a little bit of this work as well. Um, I think the main thing I would like to, to say is uh, we did a number of just, I'm a big believer, you can have all these fancy gene models and ideas about how things work, but in the end you actually have to go back and see how it actually plays out in real people. And so, you know, we had documented cases where there'd be like 5% involvement and just tons of IgM everywhere. And Vice versa, 90% involvement, almost none. And, um, you know, and so I think the, the way this hit home the hardest, we'd started to think that this was maybe being um, driven by some tumor specific process. So how active the tumor was, was giving us some sense of what was happening there. And I think Brutinib actually sort of helped answer that question because the, the bone marrow reduction with the Brutinib treatment can be minimal, but we have these amazing responses in IgM and in great increases in the hemoglobin levels. Uh, with, and again, with the marrow still, you know, with minimal change in some cases. Sometimes it responds very nicely, but sometimes it doesn't. And so these, these, these processes can be uncoupled, essentially, and we think that there is some cell signaling that uh, is happening that's driving this and that abrutinib is able to interfere with, allowing patients to feel better, to have their counts improve. Uh, without getting rid of the underlying disease. So. Uh, I, I'd just like to bring up one other point in regard to this, and that is 
that the bone marrow is a large organ. It's about the size of one's liver, but it is scattered over a relatively large area, and the bone marrow is not equal throughout. It's heterogeneous, so to speak, and you can put in your aspirate needle and then your biopsy needle uh, and uh, find a marked difference in the number of uh, lymphocytes or lymphoplasmacytoid uh, cells. And so uh, I've often uh, thought that the bone marrow is actually uh, more accurate in general than I would, uh, that would really expect. But uh, don't, the bottom line here with bone marrow infiltration is that the amount of infiltration uh, is not important and it may be very, very high uh, and the hemoglobin perfectly normal and uh, the patient may get along for a long period of time. So don't uh, treat or not treat simply because of the uh, number of lymphocytes and plasma cells in the uh, bone marrow. Uh, are there any, uh, any questions <coughs> in Dutch there that, uh, that we should address? I think I have one here. Uh, this is a question about treatment. Um, I have uh, Waldstone's disease for, one, for, more, for more than one year now. My IgM is uh, almost 42 grams, uh, grams per liter. I will start treatment soon. Uh, it will possibly be, be uh, rituximab, cyclophosphamide, and dexamethasone. And the question is, can I, uh, can I have, um, can I be, um, in, um, Treated? treated with a, a new type of treatment, a, a, a new treatment, I think a novel treatment. And this is because I have a background of other cancers, um, a melanoma, and in my family uh, we have uh, 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 bowel cancer. Um, and I think uh, this question is also because some people, what was discussed this meeting, uh, when you use classical chem chemotherapy like cyclophosphamide, it can induce um, secondary malignancies, um, a very, very low rate, but it, 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 that's possible. So this is a Dutch question, so I, we can speak from the Dutch uh, situation, and I think that um, uh, new treatment is not, um, uh, no novel treatment it, at the moment in the Netherlands is only uh, butinib, uh, carfilzomib or exasomib, uh, it's, and I don't uh, CAR T cells, uh, bites, it's, it's all not possible in the Netherlands. And what about Velcade? Velcade? Also, Velcade is not possible. Oh, really? So, um, yeah, for some, for some do uh, doctors in other countries, that's, that's highly unlikely, but Velcade can also not, Bortezomib cannot be given. Uh, I think uh, one um, uh, treatment, it, it's not treatment, but we, we don't use it a lot, but we hear it in this workshop and also for you, Dr. Kyle, you use it uh, and, and you show that rituximab monotherapy has a, a, a much lower response rate than uh, rituximab in combination with chemotherapy, like the CDR regimen. But if you want to avoid chemotherapy, uh, that's something that can be used. But ibutinib can only be used in patients unfit, so unfit physically, not because of a history or a background of cancer, uh, to receive um, a chemoimmune therapy. So um, I think uh, no. I think the possibilities for novel treatments is uh, difficult for this patient. But there will be uh, clinical trials. <laughs> with the BTK and yeah. uh, That's true, that's true. In the Netherlands, there uh, a trial, uh, but I don't know any starting dates yet, but we hope in the next year we will start a trial. It will be a randomized phase three trial, and also patients with newly diagnosed Waldstrom can um, be part of this trial, <coughs> and it will randomize between ibrutinib and a second generation BTK inhibitor from a Chinese uh, pharmaceutical company. Uh, and this trial, we don't know the date yet, but it will start in my hospital or in the uh, AMC of uh, Dr. Kersten, and we will announce it on our websites when it's uh, open. Uh, but I think a trial, that's very good, is I think the only option for these patients in the Netherlands. 
Okay, I uh, uh, think our time is just about up, but I would like to ask uh, one question. There have been a couple of questions here related to this, and basically, uh, Dr. Hunter, uh, should I have my uh, uh, MED-88 tested? What is MID-88? Maybe <clears throat> that, that's the mutation. Yeah. Right. So MID-88 is the, the gene that's mutated in over 90% of Wallenstrom's patients. Um, you know, <clears throat> I w I'd like to preface this by saying that I am a researcher and not a physician. So, um, so, so don't take my word for this. Um, <laughs> but if I were, if I were in your shoes, um, I think it would be very useful to know. Um, there are, it is actually recommended at this point as a part of the official workup uh, as in, the, in the consensus criteria for, for Waldenstrom's at this point. Um, people who don't have mid-88 mutations do have, some, some of them at least, have a much more aggressive uh, course of disease and that would maybe be something that you and your physician would want to, to know and talk about. And it's also important, and I mentioned this in my presentation as well, which is not all mid-88 mutations fall under this classic one, the L265P. And so just because that comes back as negative doesn't mean that you don't have a mid-88 mutation uh, unless you screen the entire gene, so, uh, which can be complicated and that can't always be done. Yeah, I think uh, just to sum it up very quickly here, I think that uh, if uh, 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 the study or the uh, looking for the mid-88 mutation is, uh, is feasible, then the information should be obtained. For you as an individual person, uh, there isn't really any uh, there's not going to be any effect now on how your doctor treats you or takes care of you. But we do need more information on this, and as time goes on, we may, uh, well, modify the, uh, the uh, uh, definition of Waldenstrom's and uh, could limit it to uh, to those with a mutation, but we know that other patients with different uh, histology may also have the mid-88 uh, uh, mutation too. So right now it's, I think, a fact-finding uh, sort of thing, and we just need to get more information. Yes, can I nuance it uh, just a little bit? Because I, uh, we do it on a routine basis, and we do uh, next-generation sequencing, so. Uh, we also find the other mutations, but actually I think because more than 90% of the patients have the mutation, yep. you don't really uh, need it in clinical practice, except for the patients where you are in doubt whether it's the right, as you said, the right diagnosis, because I have several patients that were referred to me who actually have a high IgM level and a lymphoma, but they turn out uh, to have marginal zone lymphoma, which yes. is a different <clears throat> type of lymphoma. Yeah. Uh, and it uh, warrants also a different treatment. So I think it's, uh, it, you don't need it in the majority of patients because it, the diagnosis is very clear without it. Uh, so uh, that's yeah. just what it, I wanted to say. <laughs> it's a practical. Uh, and I think with that, uh, with that note, I want to thank the uh, panelists uh, for their uh, input here. And I want to thank the audience, the patients, and their caregivers here. Uh, for uh, par uh, attending and participating today. And I guess uh, all of us should apologize to you for yeah. not uh, knowing more about your disease. But uh, uh, I can guarantee, I can guarantee that the next time around, there will be more information. Yes, we're working on it. Yes. yes. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kyle. Uh, I It's amazing because you have so much experience and we can learn so much uh, from you and all the clinical uh, experience that you have. It's great for us to, that you were here at the meeting. 
Um, so there are uh, several things I would like to say. I, of course, I would also like to thank all of you for being here, and I would especially like to thank uh, Hans Geurer of Hematon and Elena uh, from uh, the IWMF for uh, preparing the meeting. Uh, Also, uh, uh, Chris Patterson and all the volunteers uh, who came all the way from uh, the US, most of them, to help, uh, to help us uh, through the whole conference. It's been an amazing experience, I must say. Uh, and there were several questions as well about the presentations. So we will make the presentations available uh, in English and in Dutch on the IWMF uh, and Hamilton uh, websites. And uh, one final thing uh, for uh, which might be, become a collector's item, we have some conference bags uh, left, so <laughs> there's about uh, 25 of them, so uh, anybody who would like uh, to have this uh, very special item, uh, you're welcome to take one uh, with you. Uh, yes, and I hope to see you at the next uh, meeting. Uh, thank you so much.